his master's degree from the University of Tehran and his PhD from the University of Frankfurt. His major fields of interest have been Persian literature, classical and modern, and the history of religion. He has taught Persian language and literature in Germany and Italy, then at Harvard, and currently he's at the University of Chicago where he is an associate professor of Persian literature and language. Dr. Moed has published three books and numerous articles. He is presently editing a manuscript which collects 800 letters written by P Persian scholars in the Middle Ages. This evening he is going to speak on the topic of modern Iran political and economic change. At the close of his speech, there will be an opportunity for questions and answers. Dr. Moyan. Ladies and gentlemen, <coughs> early in this century, up to 921, Iran was at the verge of its very existence. Towards the end of that period, there were evident signs of a political collapse and annihilation. Two rebellions in two of the most important parts of Iran, Azerbaijan and Gilan, near the Russian borders, were fighting a war against the government to free the people of those areas from the boundless sufferings caused by the corruption of the central government. Unrest prevailed everywhere. The southern and western tribes were more loyal and obedient to British agents than to Iranian authorities. There was very little left of anything that we, stretching our imaginations, could call law, human rights, and social order. Though officially still independent, the open interference of some foreign countries in all inner affairs of Iran was such that even unimportant local cases of individual disputes could not be settled without permission and consent of those foreign consulate or their military agents. Illiteracy was so common that certainly over 98% of a nation which in the past had so immensely contributed to human culture was at this time unable to read and write. Besides a few foreign schools, there were some old-fashioned maktabs, classes where only a handful of small boys would squat on the dusty floor of a gloomy room all day long repeating verses from the Quran or exercising calligraphy. Half of the population, women and girls, was treated like animals belonging to different possessions of men. Diseases of all kind were commonly spread. These were almost no mod there were almost no modern hospitals, no health care, and no learned doctors. Unlimited corruption was openly practiced by everyone who could use some sort of power. The chain of bribing began at the very top with the king himself who was bribed by the ministers and going down, down grade by grade to the very bottom of a helpless and poor class of peasants and farmers 
who were robbed by soldiers and local tax collectors of the very bare minimum necessary for a life of slavery, and thus driving as miserable sick beggars into roads and city streets which were filled with the poor mob, donkeys, and caravans of camels. Mixed with them were also the many mullahs, those godless clergymen whose sole function was to sanctify wrongs of the ruling class of a thousand rich landlord families to perpetuate the old conventions of a lazy bygone world and the superstitious habits of a misunderstood religion against penetration of any new ideas and knowledge. The government had since long forgotten the very purpose of its existence. Instead of preserving the entity of the country and defend the rights of its people, the ministers acted like most humble and devoted servants of foreign representatives. State's treasury was empty. Banks did not exist except two which were established by England and Russia. Many concessions were given to European governments and companies in order to receive cash money with, with which to finance the expensive repeated journeys of the monarchs who since the 70s of the 19th, 19th century had discovered the pleasures of traveling to Europe for pure personal amusement. It is not possible nor indeed necessary to depict the true conditions of Iran under the Qajar dynasty in only a brief introduction of a lecture. Only in the light of this background, one will be able to understand the importance of what happened under Reza Shah and after the Second World War. Enough to say that Iran had reached the absolutely deepest point of its 2,500 years of recorded history. Now the turning point had come. A new age had to start. This nation could not go down. It had so many times survived terrible devastations, once by the Greeks, then by, then by the Romans, then so overwhelmingly by the Arabs, followed by the terrible massacres of the Mongols and Tatars, and repeated invasions of the nomadic hordes from Central Asia. Iranians had culturally always defeated these foreign invaders and assimilated them with their own char characteristic civilization. Even Islam itself as religion, despite its deep penetration in all spheres of human life, did not remain an exception to this rule. With the advent of Islam, Egypt, Mesopotamia, Syria, North Africa, they all became Arab nations. Iranians not only maintained their language and thereby their entity, but also the form of Islam they accepted had the mark of their own philosophy and independence. During the 19th century, first serious contacts with the West were established. These, there appeared a number of reformers with great plans for modern modernization and progress. Indeed, there was no lack of distinguished, honest, and well-qualified leaders who tried to introduce some social reforms and adopt Western systems of law and government. It was under their influence and due to their activities that Iran for the first time experienced a revolution, the so-called Tobacco Revolution in 1892. The powers of unrest continued until 1905 when the famous Constitutional Revolution broke out, which lasted more or less until 1911. 
As, as a result, the Shah's despotic powers were broken. He committed himself to the limits of democratic monarchy. A parliament came into being, and the will of the nation was represented through its delegates in the lower house, the Majlis. But it seems that the time had not yet come for Iran to enter into the new age of the Western civilization. The chaos caused by the First World War and the presence in the country of foreign troops was added to, to the existing confusion among a nation which polit politically was not yet mature enough to make the best use of its gained freedom. Riots broke out in many parts of the country. Political parties were formed, which were rather interest clubs and added to this unity and mistrust of the people. Such was the miserable state of affairs in 1921 when Reza Khan launched a coup d'etat and brought the state and country under his own control. He first acted as Minister of War, then in 1923 became Prime Minister, who early in 1925 demanded from the Majlis and was granted dictatorial powers. In October of the same year, the Majlis deposed the absentee Shah Ahmad, the last member of the Qajar dynasty to proclaim only some weeks later Reza Khan as the new king of Iran, who then assumed the title of Reza Shah Pahlavi. Thus, the year 1925, or more correctly, 1921, marks not only the beginning of a new dynasty in Persia's history, but far more important, the start of a completely new age in the long history in its radical consequences comparable only to the conquest of Iran in the year 650 AD by Arabs, which divides the history of that land into the ancient pre-Islamic period and the Islamic one. This comparison is justified in as much as the coup d'etat of 1921 was followed by decisive political consequences similar in their gravity to those of the year 650, though, however, in a totally reverse order. In 650, Persia lost her independence and was subjugated to the Arab rule Whereas in 1921, she shook off the yoke of colonial pressures, especially of Russia and Great Britain, and became free again. The comparison is justified also culturally, because 1921 closed the age of a culture we can call the Islamic culture, which was dominated by a code of laws, traditions, and moral norms and even a literature and certain branches of knowledge, all originating in Middle Ages and dictated by tenets of a religious system which encompassed all human life. And that is exactly what had happened in 650 with the advent of Islam, which had totally defeated and removed the ancient religion and culture of Iran. I would like to go even a step further and predict, although it's still it's too early, that someday in future, the historians will consider 1921 as the year in which is Islam itself as religion received the final blow and gave up its life in Iran, even if its believers for generations perhaps continued to keep its body and tried to revive it. Now let us turn our attention to the reign of Reza Shah and find out what happened in the years between 1921 and 1941. In these 20 years, 
one can generally say Iran's social, economic, and political order changed and foundations were laid for a modern, progressive, and prosperous life of a new generation to be raised, educated, and take its responsible place in the community of modern nations. A basic fact about the new political order was this, that in those years, only one man could do anything. Of the rest, obedience were all that was required. A great old statesman and leader of the Constitutional Revolution, defending himself in a speech in 1951, said that those were the days when there was only one actor, everybody else being tools in his hands. Reza Shah was a strong dictator who found no real purpose in the prevailing confusion of a conflicting group of factions of the old corrupt deputies, ministers, wealthy landlords, and ignorant politicians. His will dismissed the young democracy and degraded the majlis to a nominal house absolutely obedient to his commands. One of the first acts of Reza Shah was to establish the unity of the country and concentrate power of authority in the, in the body of his government. Thus, he successfully eliminated the tri tribal powers of those rebellious chieftains who used to receive their instructions from the invisible agents of the two mighty neighbors of Iran. Within a very short period of time, he created a unity, a safety, and security almost unparalleled in the recent thousand years of Iran's history. Moreover, he abolished all the thousands of titles which used to be sold as signs of nobility as well as all religious titles and the prerogatives attached to them. He unveiled the women and let them participate in the life of the nation and carry the share of the burden. The girls were encouraged and urged to enter modern schools. Already in 1921, a higher council of education was set up to reform the school system and introduce modern sciences to Iran. The Ministry of Education rapidly built hundreds of elementary and high schools with a new ambitious program, which was, however, mainly based on principles of learning the theories and memorizing the formula. Large numbers of qualified teachers were needed, and so in those few years, 37 teacher training colleges were founded throughout the country. Evening classes were also set up, in which by 1938, a total of 100, 124,000 adults were enrolled. Different ministries opened a series of professional and technical colleges. German experts did great service in this field. Already in 1922, they had founded a technical college in Tehran. Later, they opened new industrial schools in Tabriz, Shiraz, and Isfahan. A modern university, as the crown of all these educational institutions, could not be built until 1934. The judicial system of Iran, which up to late 20s was still religious and practiced by or under direct supervision of clergymen had also to undergo a severe process of re-examination and change. Modern civil law was one of the things Iran urgently needed. A big clash between the clerical circles 
and the fanatical followers with the Shah's European trained and secularly oriented lawyers could not be avoided. In 1928, the able Minister of Justice, Dawar, presented to the Majlis the first volume of a modern civil, civil code, followed by two more volumes next year. The Shah did not rush the Majlis with the ratification of the new civil law, which finally approved, was approved in 1935. Another project of the Shah was concerned with plans to settle down the two million tribal people of Iran who for thousands of years had lived the free life of nomads in open space, migrating twice a year from cold regions to warm regions and vice versa. With going into details, without going into details, it must be noted that his efforts in this respect failed because those tribes, unlike the poor and oppressed class of the settled peasants, <coughs> would not yield to cruelties and pressures of those corrupt agents who were in charge of carrying the new spirit throughout the country. The example showed again that one man cannot change the face of a nation just overnight. No matter how much false pride and nationalistic emotion is blown in the air by march music, military parades, and propagandistic slogans coined by agents of the new regime, process of education and change needs time. The millenary celebration for the great national poet Ferdowsi held in 1935, which brought a crowd of distinguished scholars from all over the world to Iran with a flood of scholarly publications in many languages. Systematic archaeological search carried by famous expeditions from several Western countries resulting in some fantastic discoveries which expanded our knowledge of Iran's ancient art and history. Construction of national monuments for great poets and kings, creating beautiful museums to house precious manuscripts, works of art and historical documents, which in the past used to be plundered and filled the great museums of Europe, opening of a college of music to teach, cultivate, and gather the folk music, and also train modern composers, introducing for the first time Western sports in Iranian schools and encouraging the youth of Iran to enter the Olympic Games, setting up a modernly organized army with strong sense of discipline, which derived its inspiration and direct guidance from the strong person of the Shah himself, who had once started his career as a soldier in a small town. These and many other similarly useful and important achievements helped enhance the nationalistic feelings of the people and unite the many ethnic groups of which it is composed. Education, however, as I said, it is a process which bears fruit only after a long time, which Reza Shah was not fortunate enough to have. These basic, basic reforms aside, also the external face of the country had to be changed. So new roads were built, beautiful, impressive buildings constructed in all cities and towns, modern streets were laid and public parks created, stadiums and exhibition halls constructed, even new Western type of hats and dressing enforced, and finally, the most spectacular project of Reza Shah's reign, the Trans-Iranian Railway started and finished. Before Reza Shah, Iran 
had less than 160 miles of railroad in short fragments here and there, which mostly did not operate. The dream of a modern railway had existed long before. Its fulfillment uh, was the greatest single innovation of Reza Shah and probably the one project which filled his heart with more delight than anything else. Reza Shah's plan was to connect the Caspian Sea with the Persian Gulf by a railway which, starting from the north, had first to cross the tremendous Alborz Mountains, then enter the plain of Tehran, join the capital to the cities of Qom and Iraq in central plateau of this country, before entering again the Zagros Mountains and reach the plain of Khuzestan, before ending at the shore of the Persian Gulf. In order to avoid the Iranian railway serve British interests, he created a new port, Bandar Shahpur, on the eastern channel into the Gulf as the railhead. Similarly, in the north, he created the new port of Bandar Shah as the other railhead on the Caspian Sea, instead of using the active Bandar Anzali, which was the traditional naval center and link between Russia and Iran. The construction was carried in different phases and, all, and also simultaneously in different places by experts and companies from several countries, including the United States, Germany, Sweden, Italy, Belgium, Denmark, and Switzerland, Australia, the USSR, Japan, and Yugoslavia were among the countries which supplied Iran with necessary material and equipment. The great and impossible problem was how to finance this project. Reza Shah had decided that it should be built without foreign aid. His solution was to impose a special tax on tea and sugar. This worked and the fantastic Trans-Iranian Railway, with its many hundreds of short and long tunnels and bridges, passing up to 4,600 feet high on the mountains, was finished in 1938, 11 years after the work had started. No power could achieve this other than the strong will and energy of Reza Shah himself. <clears throat> so far, I have addressed myself to a brief description of Iran's history before and after 1921 up to 1941. Iran's geographical location as a crossroad between East and West has again and again exposed it to many invasions and destructions. The motive of the Allied armies to attack Iran in 1941 allegedly was the friendly relations the Shah maintained with Nazi Germany and the presence of a large colony of German citizens in Iran who it was believed were preparing the grounds for the ever advancing German troops in Caucasus. No matter how much truth there might have existed in this allegation, the evident fact is never denied that the primary goal of the Allied countries 
was to use Iran, the best, the shortest, and probably the only possible route to send many millions of to tons of war supply and munition from the United States and England to Soviet Union. The damage Iran had to suffer in exchange for the service it rendered to the free world and the cause of victory was indeed great. Once more, the unity of the nation was destroyed, its hard work of progress interrupted, its independence disregarded, its economic sources plundered, its peace and security violently disrupted, and its future made uncertain. Mohammad Reza Shah was only 22 years old when he ascended to the throne of kingdom in September 1941. For some years, he had attended a Swiss college. Upon his return to Iran, he visited the Iranian military academy, and for over two years, he accompanied his royal father in all his trips and ceremonial inauguration of new enterprises. And still, it cannot be claimed that he was well prepared for the overwhelming responsibility of a king at such a crucial time, when the country had to face a thousand difficulties created by the war and the presence of very demanding, if not openly commanding, foreign troops in his land. All the enemies of the dynasty were now free. Political prisoners were released, and turmoil was unleashed everywhere. A misunderstood and misused freedom of press was granted. Old and new opponents, communists, and reactionaries alike were free and had immediately started a, a stormy campaign of revenge against the young Shah. Economic troubles and inflation, unemployment, lack of funds to continue the old projects and start new ones, and the unbelievable amount of poverty and hunger were problems which nobody could help, help to solve in the turbulent years of the war. At this time, many political factions without any clear plan and purpose came into being only to increase the horrible disorder and anarchistic confusion. There appeared also one real political party, the famous Communist Today Party. Supported and protected by the Soviet Union, successful in recruiting many thousands of members, mostly students, teachers, and workers, because it had a philosophy, an ideology, and a clear program. For five years, Iran was a wild battlefield of all sorts of conflicting interests. Those years, which formed the first phase of Iran's history under the new Shah are marked by a total lack of any kind of discipline in political life of the country, further by hunger and un unemployment, disorder, and daily demonstrations of the wild mob, quite often ending with plundering private shops on central streets of the city. When the war was over, the troubles continued to exist. British and American troops left Iran soon after the end of the war. This was promised to Iran in a treaty according to which all foreigners had to withdraw from Iran within six months after the war. The USSR did not care to respect Iran's sovereignty nor her own signature. Russian troops remained to complete their plans of separating Azerbaijan and parts of Kurdistan from Iran. In that area, they had set up a satellite government which they called the People's Democracy, with a communist regime trying to divide the country into separate parts. 
Russian troops would not allow the Iranian army to march into the area and get rid of those handful agents of a foreign state. Iran notified the United Nations Security Council of the Soviet interference in its internal affairs. The existence of the United Nations gave Iran a chance to bring its case for the first time to the attention of the entire world. The West acted with firm firmness, and the famous Iranian statesman Ahmad Ghavam, premier at this moment, displayed a remarkable political talent in a game which ended with Russia's withdrawal, followed by Iranian troops marching into Azerbaijan and smashing the aforementioned separatistic movement. In exchange for their withdrawal from Iranian territory, Qabam had, among other things, promised the Soviets the concession of all oil fields in the northern provinces of Iran. When this bill was presented to the Majlis by the succeeding prime minister, one of the deputies passed a resolution among the members of the House forbidding forever any concessions to be granted to any foreign states. This man was Dr. Mossadegh, then the first deputy of the Majlis elected from Tehran. <coughs> the man who was to dominate the political arena of Iran during the second phase of the new period, that is from 1946, when the war was over and Azerbaijan returned to Iran up to the summer of 1953 when a plot or riot set an end to his power. Let us first describe the general conditions of Iran in these years. The foreign troops now had left, but the aftermath was by no means easier to bear. Troubles of all kinds continued to exist. Clashes between the communists and the old aristocracy went on. University and even high school classrooms became platform of political dispute and communist propaganda. Terror and assassination of the public figures was a common occurrence. Within a few years, several most talented journalists, a great historian, a minister of education, and two prime ministers were killed. In 1948, the first attempt was made on the campus of the University of Tehran to kill the Shah himself. Only the bullets had failed to cause to the target more than a few unimportant injuries. Roughly speaking, these were, there were true groups with different ends. The Shah and his followers wanted a strong monarchical centra centralization with a policy of alignment with the United States and the West. The communists favored the conversion of the monarchy into a republic with strong ties, of course, with the USSR. And thirdly, <coughs> those politicians grouped in the National Front with Dr. Mossadegh as their leader whose most sincere purpose was to eliminate every foreign influence and also reduce the powers of the Shah to the limits of a democratic monarch. In these years, the Shah was still a too unimportant figure to attract the great masses of the intellectuals. Dr. Mossadegh instead seems to have fascinated most people of the country by his honesty, integrity, sincerity, sympathy shown for real interests of Iranians and nothing else, and also a power of speech able to enchant the listeners. He was an old aristocratic figure, a, an opponent of the old Shah <coughs> as a dictator, 
who therefore had thrown him for some years into jail. One should feel sorry for him and for Iranians who turned to him at a time when he was already too old and not flexible enough to master the ever-increasing complex of problems, especially during the 28 months of his office as prime minister. Oil was Iran's cash gold, which for almost 45 years had been exploited by an English company with only little, little benefit for its owners. This company had become, according to Mossadegh, the nest of British influence in Iran, which he at no price was ready to tolerate. His main political doctrine was therefore <laughs> the nationalization of all Iranian oil resources. Only a few week, weeks after the prime minister Razm Ara was assassinated by the hand of fanatical man in March 1951. Mossadegh, by unanimous vote of both houses, became premier of Iran and vigorously started with the implementation of the law of nationalization, which was approved by the house earlier that month. In the great political battle which followed, Dr. Mossadegh had to deal with the British government and the United States of America. Soon thereafter, the Iranian oil industry closed down. British technicians and personnel were evacuated. Mossadegh defended Iran before the United Nations Security Council in New York and then before the International Court of Justice in Holland. He many times sought the economic aid of the United States, which was denied. The Soviet Union, of course, did not help either. She seemed to have seen the final victory of the Communist Party approaching. In the end, Mossadegh was left alone to cope with the tremendous problems he had no means to solve. The conflict with the Shah became deeper and deeper. A revolt of the army, which obviously was planned and supported by American military personnel, broke out and ended, ended the second phase of Iran's past post-war history. The heritage of this phase can be considered as a ruin of Iranian economy, which on the other hand brought a real sense of independence with increased revenues in oil royalties according to a new treaty which soon after Mossadegh's downfall was signed. Mossadegh's movement certainly awakened the ruling elite of Iran and made them aware of the responsibility Iran and the whole world expects from them to assume if they want to survive the challenges of a new age. <clears throat> the period which follows Mossadegh's downfall is likewise to be divided in two phases. The first one lasts near to 10 years, during which the country struggles for political stability and economic welfare. The second one is a period of the most dramatic challenges of progress and growth Iran has ever experienced. This process had of course started in the late 50s, but not as systematically planned and vigorously accomplished as after 1963 when the Shah decisively took the unquestioned lead and proclaimed his program of the so-called White Revolution. The first act of the new government in 1953 was to mercilessly annihilate the two major opponents of the new regime as the, as the symbol of which the Shah was to emerge, the Tudé party and the National Front. Moreover, the lesson from the past had convincingly shown 
that the Shah could no longer base his hopes on old corrupt aristocrats who belonged to an age which over 30 years before had come to an end. Of this elite, only those remained on the scene who com combined the loyalty to the crown with honesty, total submission to his will, and active collaboration with plans the Shah and his government were going to unfold. A powerful and well-equipped army under the Shah's own command rapidly purified from subversive elements who had penetrated into it now stood ready to safeguard the new order and shatter every serious opposition and resistance. A security department on the model of CIA uh, was created to watch the people and keep record of their ac activities. Certainly, anarchy should not be allowed to be sold for freedom, nor democracy not exercised by responsible leaders should legitimate manipulations to undermine the country's political stability and eventually betray its very entity. However, since in politics, ends always justify means, no matter how sincere the intentions here have been, the means which were employed did not always conform with those holy principles which make man's life worth living. At any rate, experience of the following years proved that Iran's political stability was the only factor which could gain the confidence and subsequently the economic aid of the Western world. After some months of negotiations, the concession of Iran's oil industry under new terms and in a completely different form was granted in 1954 to an international consortium composed of eight Western oil companies. Work was soon started again and the great refinery of Abadan resumed its operation. Money began to flow into Iran's totally dried out treasury. The United States lifted restrictions and first granted, first grant of $45 million was soon approved. Diplomatic relations with England were re-established and Iran's political and social conditions gradually returned to normal. However, inner tranquility was not all that Iran needed. It only created the necessary at atmosphere for reforms and, mod and modernization to be continued. Iranians were now determined to set up a framework of well-designed development planning instead of doing what just a momentarily need would require or flashing of a catching device might inspire them to do. There was a seven-year plan before. There was a seven-year plan before. The six circumstances had not allowed it to be accomplished. The first plan had been launched in 1948, but lack of financial resources, machinations of the old ruling class to guarantee their and only their own share of benefits, social disorder, and finally, irresponsibility and incapability of the officials in charge had caused it to become a failure. The total expenditure of that plan had been, uh, was supposed to be $280 million, but due to the oil conflict, only 53 million had been possible to invest into its projects. The second development plan covering seven years from 1955 to 1962 
with a budget almost 24 times as high as that of the first plan, namely about $1 billion, $200 million, marked a gigantic step towards the goal of industrialization. Its main function was to lay down physical and social infrastructure for the economy in order to accelerate economic and social development. It included construction of dams, roads, ports, and airports, as well as schools, te technical and vocational centers, and urban facilities. According to a talk given by the deputy, deputy director of the plan organization, 1968 in New York, on which I have to rely for much of the following information, more than 500 municip municipal projects, including electricity system, water supply, road asphalting, and similar projects were implemented. Also, endemic and communicable diseases, especially smallpox and malaria were brought under control. The years from 1962 to 67 were covered by the third five-year plan. The major objective of this plan was to gear the economy for a proper growth with an estimated annual increase of 6% in gross national product. It surpassed the target by achieving the average rate of 8% per year. The total expenditure of $3 billion, $66 million showed the unusual progress Iran had achieved. The fourth plan, again for a period of five years up to 1973, with an appropriation of about $7 billion, aims at an average rate of 9% annual increase in Iran's gross national product. 15% of this amount is allocated to social programs relating to education, arts, culture, health, medical services, and the like. In 1956, Iran's population was less than 19 million, and today it is over 28 million which means an average rate of growth of about 3% per year. This rate of growth expresses the enormous responsibilities and heavy burden which the planners have to carry out in order to achieve an optimum level of economic growth. Development pro programs have had a great impact not only in the expansion of educational system, but also on the improvement of its quality and standard. The following figures, which I quote from the aforementioned source, speak for themselves. The number of students in primary schools was 358,000 in 1948, 2 million 31,000 in 1965, and will be closed to 4 million in 1973. The number of uh, secondary school students was 36,000 in 1948, 426,000 in 1965, and is expected to reach 1,400,000 in 1973. At the technical and the vocational centers, the figures were only 700 in 1948, 17,000 in 1965 to reach 50,000 in 1973. These figures show that the total number of students at those three levels rose from 394,700 in 1948 to 2,400,000 in 1973. 
474,000 in 1965 and will reach 5,450,000 by 1973, an increase of 600% in the first 19 years and 1,400% in 27 years. At the beginning of this lecture, a brief description was given of the conditions of education and schools before 1921. I also mentioned that the first modern university was founded only in 1934. Now, after only 36 years, Iran has, in addition to many colleges, eight universities in which in 1968, approximately 58,000 students were enrolled. Projects are underway for more universities. One, for example, to be built with French assistance in Mazandaran. To the above figures, figure of university students, we have to add about 25,000 Iranian students who are enrolled in hundreds of Western universities in Europe and the United States. The progress in education has been, to a certain extent, not quite with that speed, accompanied by increase of modern hospitals, clinics, and health centers. Public health facilities have been extended to a large number of villages, and modern water supply system has been introduced in the ma majority of urban centers. 1958, the number of hospital beds did not exceed 17,500. By the end of the third plan in 1967, it reached 31,000 and will be raised to 46,000 by 1973, and it is planned to establish 500 new rural clinics during the fourth plan. And now we should see what actually the White Revolution was, which initiated the last phase of Iran's modern history. White Revolution is the name of a six-point reform program submitted by the Shah in early 63 to the nation who by almost unanimous vote approved. Another point of the revolution was concerned with political liberation of women who were given voting rights and a number of them were even elected to both houses of the parliament. Along with basic reforms in education, health, land reform, and social rights of all classes, the White Revolution provided for other reforms, such as nationalization of all forests, selling the stock of government-owned industries to help carry out the land reform program, giving a fair share in factory profits to industrial works, workers, a complete revision of election system for the parliament members, and the formation of so-called equity courts in rural areas. Later, other important points were added to the charter, which now is known as the 12-point reform program. Some years back, the social structure of the country was described as semi-feudal. Members of the so-called 1,000 families monopolized not only the wealth, but also the social prestige and political power. Middle class was mainly composed of merchants and artisans. Workers and peasants formed the lower level of the stratification, the rapid growth of economy, together with the spread of education, has brought about an upward movement of new middle class composed of in industrialists, bankers, and, and 
and an ever-increasing number of people undertaking intellectual professions. The White Revolution has strengthened the position of both workers and farmers. Social welfare ac activities accomplished in the past only as tokens of mercy and charity by some traditional religious and charity organizations has now, especially under the fourth plan, become a major area of fundamental change. The government has extended social securities throughout through social insurances to all strata of the society. Uh, let us turn our attention for a few minutes to another decisive change which Iran has experienced during the last 10 to 15 years, namely the technical and industrial evolution. Iran's sole industrial complex of any significance up to the early 50s was the oil industry, which was developed, administered, and run by British technicians and managers. <clears throat> Not only that situation is changed today, and Iranians themselves, with only limited help of foreign advisors and highly specialized Western experts, keep that industry running, but they have also managed to significantly develop it in new areas as well. A big new refinery has been built near Tehran. A network of pipelines is already as far constructed as to provide, provide the major cities with oil and natural gas. Iran has helped some other countries like India, Pakistan, and Algeria construct oil refineries of their own. One of Reza Shah's dreams was always to construct Iran's own steel mills. In those times, this project was, of course, very unrealistic and remained just a dream for another 25 years after he had left. It was the Soviet Union who finally responded to Iran's call for cooperation in this gigantic project. For the last five years, Russians have been busy creating the new industrial complex of Iran's first steel mills in a specifically for this purpose built city near Esfahan. The work is, I believe, near to completion and large parts of it are expected to start operating this year. Many hundreds of Iranians, Iranian workers and engineers have been trained in the Soviet Russia to run this new industry. Another great factories have been erected in many other places of the country as well. Among these, the machine factory in Iraq and the tractor factory in Tabriz are especially important. Branches of several Western motor car factories exist already there, and Iran has even started to export buses, passenger cars, and trucks. Iran's petrochemical industry is rapidly growing, and it is expected that the export of its products will largely increase Iran's national income. In order to be self-sufficient in commodities of daily life, Iran has set up hundreds of industrial plants manufacturing many items such as, for example, telephone, paper, furniture, glassware, textile, electric supplies, metalware, fertilizers, cement, and so on. In order to accomplish this process of industrialization, Iran has sought advice and technical ad assistance of almost all major countries of the world. The policy of protecting the country against any form of foreign influence has been a main consideration for encouraging all developed nations to invest capital in Iran and participate in its development projects. 
Iran is member of an economic pact with Turkey and Pakistan known as RDC, which means Regi Regional Cooperation for Development. The link between these three countries is strengthened through frequent conferences and common projects. Construction of new roads and railways has been vigorously promoted during the last 15 years. In 1968, Iran had 2,700